about telling Jacob's whole story, and in discussing Jacob some, I mentioned Joseph's grandfather, Jacob's father Isaac, without going through Isaac's whole story. And in doing so, I mentioned Isaac's father, Jacob's grandfather, and Joseph's great-grandfather, Abraham. And I feel the Lord spoke to me to teach a series on the life of Abraham. No use reading the sermons of Jesus if you don't know who Abraham was. Jesus refers to Abraham several times. No use reading the epistles of Paul, particularly Romans or Galatians or Ephesians, if you don't know the details of the life of Abraham. Paul refers so often to things about Abraham. It's very use, very little use to uh, read about the life of Moses, and I'd love to do a series on the life of Moses someday before the year is out. But no use discussing that if we do not know where all of this began, and it begins with Abraham. And so please, with the help of your prayers and your kind permission, I would like to do a series on the life of Abraham. He's a towering figure. I'd like for you to open with me to Luke chapter 7. Pardon me, chapter 16, Luke 16. This is just a few days before Jesus is crucified. He is getting ready to leave Galilee and head up for, to go to Jerusalem. And uh, he's in a conflict with Pharisees as he's teaching his disciples. He's just told the parable of the prodigal son during the same day's discussion. And now he teaches this parable that we call Lazarus and the rich man. You say, what's this got to do with Abraham? Oh, if you've read it, you'll already know. Beginning with verse 19 of Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells this very familiar parable. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. By the way, of all the parables Jesus told this is the only parable in which one of the characters is named. This fellow Lazarus is the only person named by name in one of Jesus' parables. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at this rich man's gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The dog's name was not Rover, but Mo Rover. And it came to pass that the beggar, Lazarus, died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Doesn't say to heaven, but we believe Abraham was in heaven. Jesus, in talking about God being a God of the living and not of the dead, challenges the Pharisees one time and says, you call him the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And yet you say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are dead. But he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Therefore, if he is the God of Abraham, 
then Abraham is alive somewhere. Jesus pointed this out a few times. All of those who are righteous will one day in the kingdom of heaven sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the wedding feast. Abraham is alive somewhere. Abraham died nearly 2,000 years before Jesus was born. And yet Jesus speaks of Abraham as alive. He says, in another place, of course, I met Abraham one time, and we'll be looking as we go through the life of Abraham, when Abraham might have met the pre-existent Jesus Christ. 2,000 years before Jesus was born of Mary and Joseph and laid in that manger, he existed and appeared sometimes on earth. We call these pre-appearances of Christ. We call them, in theological terms, Christophanies, an appearance of Christ before Bethlehem. Jesus tells the Pharisees in the Gospel of John, I met Abraham one time, and Abraham rejoiced to see me. (laughs) And they said, well, you're not even 50 years old, Mr. Jesus. Abraham, our father, has been dead for 2,000 years. How can you say you've seen Abraham? And Jesus says, if you didn't like that, you're going to hate this. Before Abraham was, I am. When might Jesus have met Abraham? We'll find that out as we go through the life of Abraham. But here's what's interesting in this parable Jesus is telling. Lazarus, the beggar, the unclean beggar, by the way, is unclean in all three ways that Jewish people or Pharisees consider someone to be unclean. Number one, He's outside the gate. He's not blessed in life. He he has no wealth. He's, He's a beggar. And he's outside. That means that he's an unclean person, unblessed of God in life. Number two, he's unclean because he has running pussy sores on his body. We don't know if he was a leper or had some other sickness of issue, but that makes him unclean. Anyone who touches him will be unclean for seven days. And number three, he's with the most unclean of all animals, dogs. Those dogs are actually licking his sores. Lazarus is dirty, dirty, dirty. He's unblessed. He is sick. And he is in foul company. Ceremonially, Pharisees would consider him to be the epitome of uncleanness. And yet when this unclean beggar dies, he is carried by angels. And where do they carry him specifically? Jesus says that Abraham is in the kingdom of heaven. So Lazarus is carried there and put specifically into Abraham's bosom, cradled in Abraham's arms. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, Lazarus did not own a burial plot. He's a beggar. This particular Lazarus, probably not the same Lazarus who was the brother of Mary and Martha who was buried in a sepulcher when he died and raised from the dead. Probably not the same fellow, but I can make an argument that he was the same Lazarus, but I won't go into that. We'll just assume that the commentators are correct, that this was a different fellow named Lazarus. The Old Testament pronunciation of the name Lazarus was Eleazar. In the New Testament, Eleazar pronounced Lazarus. This Lazarus is a beggar. And therefore, his body is cast into the burning ravine. 
outside of Jerusalem known as Gehenna, the Valley of the Sons of Hanum, where they threw the bodies of the dead who had no burying place. Or maybe sometimes the priests would gather up a piece of ground of a person who died and there were no heirs to inherit this piece of ground. It would go to the priesthood and the priesthood would donate it as a burying place for the poor. We see that when Judas died, hanged himself, he had cast 30 pieces of silver that they had paid him for betraying Jesus. He cast it back into the, into the, the priestly palace. And with that money, they bought a parcel of ground that had been once a potter's field and made for it a burying place for the poor. So we see that that custom was also there. The body of Lazarus was either thrown into a common grave in such a place or thrown burning, to burn rather, in the, in the ravine of Hinnom, Gehenna. The rich man, however, had a sepulcher to be buried in. In other words, Lazarus' body was put in a place of uncleanness where no one would mourn for him. The rich man was put in a sepulcher where his family gathered about and wept and sang. And yet, despite the differences in their burials, there was a great contrast in how the two souls were received. Lazarus' body is carried up to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man is buried, we assume, in a fine sepulcher. But what's going on behind the scenes? In hell, he lifts up his eyes, being in torments. And the rich man, down in the flames of torment, can look up and see the kingdom of heaven. Afar off, we're told. And he sees Abraham. Seated and holding Lazarus in his bosom, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And this rich man cries from these flames and says, Father Abraham! So now we know the rich man was a Jew. He considered Abraham his father, even in the afterlife. Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and come and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in the flame. But Abraham calls toward that rich man that he sees in flames and says, Son This rich man in hell is a son of Abraham. You see, that's quite a thing for Jesus to be teaching a group of Pharisees. For Pharisaic Jews believed that they would all go to heaven simply because they were sons of Abraham. Sadducees believed that also. John the Baptist, in beginning his ministry of preaching they're baptizing people in the river Jordan preached often to them saying say not or think not to say within yourselves we are children of Abraham for if what God wanted was physical or biological children of Abraham he would be able to take these river pebbles I can see John the Baptist holding up handfuls of wet gravel from the bottom of the Jordan he would be able to take of these river pebbles and transform them into children of Abraham. But God is not just looking for biological sons of Abraham. He is looking for those who do the works of Abraham. Jesus told a group of Pharisees in the Gospel of John, you claim to be children of Abraham, and yes, you are biologically. You can trace your genealogies all the way back to Abraham. 
But Jesus said, if you were really the children of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. When I look at your genealogies, I see that you are children of Abraham. When I see your works, I see that you're not the children of Abraham. You're of the, your father, the devil. <laughs> so whoever Abraham is, he was not only the father of the Israelite nation, particularly the tribe of Judah, which became known as the Jews. When we first meet Abraham, and we will today, he's 75 years old, and God tells him, you'll be the father of many nations. And in you will all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, Abraham does not beget many children, Ishmael, then Isaac, and then four or five other sons by his third and last wife, Keturah. That's not enough. Abraham's sons are not enough to become the, the fathers of many nations. Abraham's sons, we see, we see all of them collected in Genesis chapter 25. But way back in Genesis 10, before Abraham had ever been born, we see how the sons of Noah had spread out and covered all the earth and had formed many kingdoms and kings. God is referring to those kingdoms that are already in existence. Those ethnicities and cultures and races. When he tells Abraham, all nations of the earth will be blessed in you. Nations that already exist that will not be born of Abraham. Are you following what I'm saying? Abraham first appears in Genesis chapter 12. The previous chapter, Genesis 11, tells how all of the nations of the earth were gathered at Babel. They were of all one people in one tongue and, and how they are scattered from Babel in confusion of tongues to go out and, and populate different lands. These people are already there before Abraham's ever born. And yet God tells Abraham, in a way you will become the father of them all. What does God mean? There will be something special about Abraham, not his, not his genetic makeup or his physicality. What will be special about Abraham that will reach out and touch in some way all of the people of the earth will be a spiritual quality that will emanate from his life. And here we see Abraham now, long dead from the earth, but still alive in heaven. Holding the man in his bosom, the soul of the man, who was unclean in life, but is now forever cleansed. And looking down into the flames of hell, at someone who in life was one of his direct biological descendants. And Abraham calls the soul of this rich man, my son. A rich man who was clean in life and blessed in life, but somehow missed out on doing the works of Abraham that would have got him back into Abraham's bosom. Verse 25, Abraham says to him, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things in life. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Boy, things had turned around in the eternities, hadn't they? Jesus said, many that are last will be first. Many who are first will be last. Abraham continues speaking to his son, the rich man, who is now eternally cursed. 
And beside all this, Abraham says to him, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then the rich man says, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him, Lazarus, to my father's house. Can Lazarus be raised from the dead, please, and go back to earth? For I have, still alive on earth, five brothers, brethren, that Lazarus may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham says to the soul of the rich man, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important to know your Bible. Yeah, it'd be great if I could send Lazarus back to earth to warn your five brothers. Do you think they would listen to him though? Even if he rose from the dead? <laughs> Abraham says, nay. No, no, and the rich man says, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham says to the rich man, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they persuade it, be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. What Abraham says is, they should consider the scriptures. That thing is said to you also. Consider the scriptures. You've given a long time to live. You've watched a thousand movies on television, untold sports events. How much time have you given to considering the Word of God? Some people come to church. They give God an hour out of the week, 24 hours in a day times seven. How many hours you got? A lot of them. How many hours you give to consider God? You'll come listen to a sermon. Quite often a preacher will take one verse and just preach on one verse. What do you know about the Bible? Well, you know that one verse somewhat out of context. Do you really spend time considering what God has to say and who the Bible shows that God is and what that means to you? One day you too. I don't know if Jesus is being physically literate, literal when he speaks of flames of hell or if he's speaking metaphorically. I won't get into that right now, but the point is that however that rich man literally feels, he is eternally cursed in the afterlife. Whereas Lazarus, who was somewhat cursed on earth, is now perpetually and forever blessed in the afterlife. And what does it hinge on when we get down to the end of it? The rich man would have been kind to Lazarus and done the works of Abraham toward Lazarus had he considered the scriptures had he considered Moses and the prophets. You and I have more than Moses and the prophets. We have the fulfillment of those prophecies. We have Jesus Christ and his words to consider. How much time do you spend pondering the scriptures? Father Abraham in this story makes that really the issue. My issue in bringing up that story is that Jesus tells it 2,000 years after the death of Abraham and he makes it so important that the blessed dead go to the bosom of Abraham. Why Abraham? How is he this figure of gigantic influence? The dead don't go to the bosom of Moses or David or Solomon. The dead don't go to the bosom of Elijah or Noah or even Adam.
They go to the bosom of Abraham. Why? What? Who? Was Abraham? That makes him that important. Father of nations is one answer. Thank you, Julie. Father of faith. Thank you, brother. There are certainly some terrific aspects about Abraham that we're going to learn. I'm just giving introductory this morning. Is this interesting to you? I remember the old spiritual song that you used to hear sung. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Oh, rock of my soul. What in the world does that mean? This gigantic figure, Abraham, was a descendant of Noah's. Noah's life is told in three chapters. Genesis 6, 7, 8, well, 9 also. About three and a half chapters. You know all about Noah, don't you? He's the guy that was warned of God that a flood was coming on the earth, moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. And also animal life and vegetable life was kept in that ark. And we can talk a lot about what the ark meant. The great flood came, killed everybody. People speak, well, that's a, that shows that God is a killer. God is a, no, those people were dying horribly anyway. The earth was filled with violence before the flood. Ancient battle scenes are gory and horrific. One city defeats another city, slits the throat of all the men, captures all the women and children, makes slaves of them. Terrible things happening. Suicide rate very high among women and children. Bodies wounded on battlefields are left there for the vultures to come and pick out the eyes and the, and the guts of the wounded. Sometimes fire is set on a battlefield and wounded men lie there screaming as the flames creep around them. Horrible deaths. You can go back and read the histories of the Civil War battles fought right here in this valley. And over near Fredericksburg, just 160 some odd years ago, men by the tens of thousands Wounded and cannot move, and flames all around them as those battlefields are caught on fire by cannon shot and musket shot. The people on the lines hear the wounded screaming out there in the fields between them. So have battles always been horrific, horrific. And the Bible says that before the flood, the earth was filled with such violence. Drowning, however, by contrast, is a very easy death. We don't like the idea of it, but actually once you breathe in a lung full of water, you go unconscious and drift away quickly. In that sense, God sending a flood to drown all these people was they're going to die anyway and most of them will die horribly. God comes up with the easiest death for all of them that he could think of. In a sense, the flood was a mercy. And then he says, some of you aren't going to like that, I know, but God is thinking better for me to kill them quickly and as painlessly as possible than to let them stay alive and murder one another in these horrific ways. And so the flood comes and washes all humanity away. Just before the flood, God tells Noah why. He says, because all these people, mankind, they'll just never do right. Why? Because the imaginations of their hearts are only evil continually. So that's the reason God dispensed with all of them in the flood. 
I'm just giving you a theological point. You can argue if you want to whether the flood actually occurred or is it a metaphor or is Noah a symbol or whatever. I don't really care how you think of that. You can think of it as a fairy tale. That's fine with me. I'm not going to spend time trying to prove the historicity of it to you. Consider it as a fairy tale. Aesop told fairy tales. Fables, and yet you take those knowing that they're fictional, but you derive the lessons of your life from them. Little Red Riding Hood is a fairy tale, and yet you tell it to your children. Why? Because it teaches a lesson in life. Little girls shouldn't talk to strangers while they go through the woods on the way to Grandma's house. You take all sorts of fictional things in life, the Greek myths, the Roman myths, the Nordic myths, and you derive meaning from them. I don't care if you take the Bible as a myth as long as you see what it says. And maybe if you see enough of what it says, you'll start embracing it as a reality. But it's really the message that matters more than your perspective of the validity of it. Am I making sense or am I rambling? I don't know why people will accept these fairy tales and set the Bible aside. It's something, I don't want to read that. Well, I'll tell you, it's got, it, it's got much more meaning for your life than uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves will ever have. So take it however you want, but take it. After the flood, God tells Noah, who has just stepped out of the ark and offered up a sacrifice of thanks to God. And God smells the sweet savor of the sacrifice and comes down to talk to Noah. And he says, you know, Noah, I will never do this again. I will never destroy all mankind off the face of the earth. Somebody said, yeah, he said he wouldn't do it by water. He said he would never do it by any means, not just by water. I won't indiscriminately kill everyone again. And Noah says, yes, I know why, God. You won't have to because you got rid of all the bad people and left me and my three sons and my wife and my three sons' wives. And we're the good people. You got rid of all the bad and left the good. And God said, no, Noah, that ain't why I'm not going to do it again. Because you're not as good as you think you are. God says, I look at, I look at these eight people still alive, including you. It's Noah, Mrs. Noah, their son Shem and Mrs. Shem, their son Japheth and Mrs. Japheth, and their son Ham and Mrs. Ham. I look at the eight of you, and you know what I see, God said? I, who look not on the outward appearance, but on the inward heart, I see that the imaginations of your hearts are still only evil continually from your youth. No, this is not me. God said, live on and learn. Noah lives... He's 600 years old when he comes out of the ark. He lives another 350 years. And Noah lives to see his descendants become, before he dies, he lives up to 10 generations afterward. He lives to see his descendants become just as bad as the people who died in the flood. Genesis chapter 11 Verse 10, we'll just take one of Noah's sons, Shem. Genesis chapter 11, verse 10. Is this interesting? Now, I'm just going to be teaching on Abraham for the next few weeks. So I hope you don't get bored with it. But here's where Abraham comes from. These are the generations of Shem. Shem is one of Noah's sons. Shem was 100 years old and begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. All right, when Arphaxad was born, then Noah is 602 years old. 
Go down to verse 12. And Arphaxad lived five and thirty years and begat Selah. Noah is now 637 years old. Go down to verse 14. And Selah lives thirty years and begets Eber. Noah is now a mere 667 years old. He's going to live to be 950. Go down to verse 16. And Eber lives four and thirty years and begets Peleg. Mose, uh, Noah is now 701 years old. Go to verse 18. And Peleg lives thirty years and begets Reu. Noah is 731. Verse 20, Reu lives two and thirty years and begets Selug. Noah is now 763. Verse 22, Serug lives thirty years and begets Nahor. Noah is now 793 years old. Verse 24, Nahor lives nine and twenty years and begets Terah. Noah is 822 years old when Terah is born. Who is Terah? Terah will be the father of Abraham. Verse 26, And Terah lives 70 years and begets Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Noah is now 892 years old. When Terah has his first son, his first son is not Abram, but rather Haran is the oldest son we, leave, we read later on. And Noah, Abraham is actually born when his father Terah is 130. And I'll show that to you in a minute. Terah is 130 years old when Abram is born. Now, Terah is only 70 when his oldest son Haran is born. But Abraham will be the youngest. And he'll be born when Terah is 130. At that time, Noah would have been 952 years old. That means that Noah dies two years before Abraham is born. Now by this time, we can look at the earth earlier in Genesis 10 and 11. And we'll see that Noah lived by the time Abraham is born, two years after the death of Noah. Am I making sense to you? Amen. By the time Abraham is born... The empire or the kingdom of Egypt exists with all of its various pagan gods. The kingdom of Babylon, the first Babylonian empire exists, built by a wicked man named Nimrod. And all sorts of idolatry is there. We learn that in Abraham's time, the world is full of warfare and slavery. Man's inhumanity to man. We find that there is sexual promiscuity, drunkenness, murdering, cheating, lying. Abraham is born into a world that is every bit as bad as the world before the flood. And now we begin the actual story of Abraham. You folks give me just a few more minutes. We'll get into this. Genesis chapter 11, verse 26. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. Let me paint you a picture map in the air here. We'll turn around this side and look at it. I'll draw the map from behind. Here's the great Tigris and Euphrates rivers running parallel and emptying down in the Persian Gulf. This land of these rivers that run together parallel, that's known as Mesopotamia, that double river valley. Abraham lives down here at the bottom, Ur of the Chaldees where he's born and raised. It's a delta land where these two rivers joined together and then spread out into bayous and, and finally emptied in, into the Persian Gulf. It's flat land. Abraham is born there, or Abram as he's called at this point. He will journey with his father Terah 
all the way up the length of Mesopotamia, the two rivers, and come into a Syrian country called Haran. There Terah will die, and when Abraham has buried Terah, Abraham will journey, being led by God, south down into the Jordan River Valley in the land known as Canaan, or later Palestine, or later Israel. Abraham will go down and cross the Nile and come into Egypt in Africa. And he will visit Pharaoh and then come back up and spend most of his life in the Jordan River Valley, though he'll make one brief trip back into Syria. Does this make sense? He's born way down here in Ur of the Chaldees, travels five, six hundred miles up north, then another several hundred miles down south, then another long trip into Egypt, then back up, live his life out here. Just kind of get that picture in your, in your mind. And uh, Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, and the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, the father of Iscah. Well, whoever those were. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, but they didn't get to the land of Canaan. They made it as far as Haran and dwelt there, and the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, or unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house. And I will, uh, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 70 and five years when he departed out of Haran. Now get this. With his father, Terah, he's traveled up the Tigris-Euphrates River to Haran. There Terah dies, being 205 years old. At this time, Abraham is 75 years old, we're told. That means that he had been born when Terah was 130. Am I making sense? All right. Now, Abram journeys down. Verse 1 says, The Lord had said unto Abram, Go into the land of Canaan. I'll show it to you. Abram and his father go together, make it this far, Terah dies. God had spoken, St. Stephen tells us in Acts chapter 7, that God spoke those words to Abraham when he was still in Ur of the Chaldees, his hometown down there, ruled by the emperor Hammurabi, the Babylonian king. And God had spoken to him then, saying, get out of here. Go up there, I'll show you a whole new place. You're not a member of this kingdom. You're rather going to be the father of many kingdoms. Get out from under this influence. Go up here. Get free from all other influences so that you can hear me. God had already spoken that to him. But Abram had to wait for his father to die before he obeyed God. Now I'll tell you something else about his father Terah. We will learn later. That Terah was an idolater. He worshipped many gods. You know where idolatry came from. It's people who forget the idea that there is one God, one force that creates all things. Rather, these pagan people see the sun rise in the east. Oh, it's born in a bloody red sky, like something coming out of the womb. And then they watch the sun as it rises and brightens and dominates the sky and makes its chariot ride across the sky and then begins to go down and dies in the west and also a bloody red sunset. 
And yet miraculously, they don't know how, next morning it is born again in blood. They do not know that the world is turning. It looks to them like the sun is born and dies, and maybe a new sun is born. They don't know. Maybe, maybe this sun dies and its sun, a new sun, is born tomorrow. But they, they make all sorts of mythologies about it. It's obviously some kind of a god or a deity. Then they look at Mother Moon. The moon is a female because, like a woman, goes through 28-day cycles. In fact, our word menstrual comes, the menstrual cycle of a, of a woman, it comes from the Latin word for moon, mensa. And uh, uh, so the moon is obviously a female. The mother moon, and the moon becomes a goddess, Luna, and is worshipped by some. Then there's the storm gods, we have storms come through, they have to be some kind of gods sending those lightning bolts and making those thunderous noises and rains and winds. And then there are the seasons of the harvest, so there's a winter god and a summer god and a spring god and an autumn god. Men who go down to the sea fishing have to deal with a, with a sea god who will either bless them or curse them by giving them fish in good weather or no fish in foul weather. And so all sorts of ideas of different deities, things they see in nature and in the sky that they cannot quite explain. There is really nothing intrinsically wrong with saying this is something we cannot explain. It's, going, we, we, it's got to be a God of some kind, something greater than us, something more supernatural than us. That, that's, uh, there's nothing wrong in making those assumptions. What is wrong is departing from the idea that these are just things. There is actually one God who created all... <coughs> all things, the heavens and all that are in them, the sea and all that, that is in it, and the earth and all they that dwell upon it. Now that was the quantum leap that Abraham made. He stepped away from the idea of regional gods and seasonal gods and na nature gods. Abraham somehow stepped over a line. His culture he was raised in told him there were a lot of gods. All that had informed him, all that had influenced him had told him there were many gods. His father Terah worshipped many gods. Abram one day stepped over a line and said, I step away from all of that and I come into an understanding of one God. And it was at that point that he calls upon this one God and that God responds to him and says, Abram, of all the people on the earth, Noah knew me as one God and he died only two years before you were born. But he lived to see all of his descendants Turn away from his knowledge of the one God. And now you alone have stepped into this realization that I am the only God. And Abram says, I will obey you. Travel to the land you will afterwards show me for an inheritance. But my father won't let me. And God says, wait for him to die. When Terah, they journey up to Haran. When Terah dies at the age of 130, God says, now you are free. See, God, had, God had appeared to Abram while he was still living in this pagan land, Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram just had to hold that within himself and wait until his great influence, Terah, his father, had died. And now he says, I'm free to obey you. And God says, all right, now journey south into the land of Canaan. Well, that's the only part of his story I can really tell you today. But the first thing we find about Abram is that he made a quantum leap that challenged all of his previously learned ideas. 
And he's willing to put behind him everything his people had taught him and step out into his own particular knowledge of God. Hey, have you ever made a quantum leap? I find few people do that. Some people just say, well, this, I'm, I'm an American, I was raised in America, uh, and I'll die in America and be buried in America with Americans. And I think the way our people think, and I am what our people have made me to be, and this is, this is who I am, and this is what I'll always be. Have you ever made a quantum leap? What about religion? Well, I was raised a Baptist, I was raised a Catholic, I was raised a Lutheran, whatever. And this is what I was raised to be. It's what I'll always be. Have you ever said, I'm going to step out and find out for myself as an individual? It's called a quantum leap. Paul did it. Abram did it. Hey, Moses really did it. Have you ever done it? We're going to look at several things about Abram or Abraham as he comes to be known later. One of the things I want to show you is the nine times that God appears to Abraham and converses with him. We just read the first. Nine times Abram will have a conversation with God. We'll see a progression, a deepening of Abram's understanding. We will see, since Abram is sent to the kings of the nations, we will look at the kings. Sychem, More, Pharaoh, Aner, Eshkol, Mamre, Abimelech, Melchizedek, all these, and the king of Sodom, all these kings that Abram will meet and deal with. We'll learn something from that. Will that be interesting to you? Another thing that we'll see in the life of Abraham is God tells him, you're going to be the father of nations. And his wife, Sarah, we learn at the very beginning, is barren, cannot conceive any children. So Abraham will make three attempts to present a son to God. <laughs> we just read that he carries his orphan nephew, Lot, with him. And he'll try to raise Lot as a son. And it won't work out. So then Abram will try to adopt a man named Eliezer and raise him as a son. And God says, this isn't the one I was talking about. And then Sarah will devise a way under Babylonian law to get a child of her own by using her, her slave girl as a surrogate. And Ishmael will be born. And God says, that ain't the one. And as Abraham goes through these three different ways to try to make God's word work, here, Lot will be the son. You promised me a son. It's got to be Lot. No? Okay. Uh, Eliezer, I'll adopt him as my son. No? Well, uh, okay, we'll get Ishmael. He's my son. Uh-uh. I'm getting old now, God. I'm 100 years old. How's this going to happen? God said, wait and see. question is, will you believe me? And, and, and we see Abraham, we'll, we'll go through the different psychological and deepening spiritual phases of Abraham's life. Is this interesting to you? We will also see Abraham growing in his ways of knowing God. He first knows God as Elohim, one of the gods. Then when God speaks to him, he learns that he is Adonai, the Lord, he who is to be obeyed and listened to. Then he'll come to know God as El Shaddai, the Almighty. Then he'll come to know God as Elion, Elion El, the Most High, above all others. And then he'll come to know God as Jehovah Jireh, the self-existent one. We'll move along seven different ways God, Abraham comes to know God. Will that be interesting to you? We'll also look at varying ways that God will know Abraham. God first sees him as a son of Noah. Then he sees Abraham as a believer. Later he will call Abraham his friend. Later he will call Abraham justified by faith. 
and different ways of moving along with Abram. And then we'll look at three ways that God tells Abraham to know his unborn descendants. They'll be like the dust of the earth. They'll be like the sands of the sea. Number three, they'll be like the stars of the heaven. Three natures in his descendants, which, which represent physical descendants. It's biological, like the dust of the earth. Then you'll have descendants that are like the sands of the sea. The sea represents the soul. We'll be talking about that. These will be people you've influenced from your mind and your persuasion. and You'll touch their souls. And then there'll be people like the stars of the sky. That's the, that represents spirituality. There'll be people who are spiritually children of Abraham. I didn't even get an amen on that. But I'll be discussing it. And we'll look at the 14 chapters of Abram's life and see why he becomes the towering giant. Today we speak of three great Abrahamic faiths in the earth. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All three of those religions look to Abraham as the great founding father of them. Yes, even Muslims. We'll discuss why Abraham... Now 4,000 years since he lived is still such a towering figure. And why people still argue over which ones are the true sons of Abraham. And why Abraham matters so much. Well, that's it for this morning. You say, are you going to make a conclusion? Nope. <laughs> you going to make a